I, I said last time and I've said for a while that the social justice movement is like a train with several boxcars. And, you know, the, the, the lead boxcar is the racial identity or, or racial Marxism boxcar. But behind that boxcar are several other boxcars. There are several other issues that are linked to critical theory, uh, cultural Marxism, um, not only race, but for example, the issues of sexual identity. So LGBTQAI2+, um, by the way, I didn't say that to be funny. That's just where it is now. Now it's gotten up to LGBTQAI2+. In fact, in Canada's new law, and I'll be talking about this in the service later this morning, in Canada's new law, C4, which if you're not familiar with Canada's new legislation, Bill C4, that has become law in Canada, the law against conversion therapy, um, they use LGBTQ2. Um, and, and that two is important because it links back to critical theory and critical race theory because the two is for two-spirit, which is the indigenous, Native American, Native Canadian, whatever, Indian way of talking about this kind of identity. It was referred to as two-spirit. So in their intersectional nod to critical race theory, they put LGBTQ2 on the bill there in Canada because there is an inexorable link between critical theory, critical race theory, and queer theory, uh, and sexual identity Marxism. And it's really becoming more and more prevalent today and more and more prevalent through our schools. So when we talk about the next generation, and preparing the next generation. We're hearing a lot in schools and at school board meetings about you know, critical race theory and critical theory, and that's great. But what's really more significant, I would argue, is the sexual identity Marxism through the LGBTQIA2 plus movement. The acronym is just going to get longer and longer and longer, right? And one of the things that we'll talk about is the fact that this, this acronym really exposes the identity behind the movement because the acronym is filled with contradictions, right? The acronym is filled with contradictions, and we'll talk about that, about that more as we get into this. There's some of these things that, that can't coexist. They're logically inconsistent with one another, but the only thing that holds them together is critical theory and cultural Marxism. That, that's it, that's the only thing that holds them together. Beyond that, some of the acronyms are, are, are mutually exclusive and almost at war with one another, but they're part of the same critical social justice movement. They're part of the same application of critical theory part of the same application of cultural Marxism, and therefore they have the same goals and that keeps them bonded together. Right now we're seeing it um, expanded and expressed in our schools through a number of things, but perhaps most um, covertly through what's called uh, SEL or social emotional learning. And you may have heard of SEL, you may have heard of this whole social emotional learning push within the government education system. Um, and it is the Trojan horse that right now is advancing critical theory, cultural Marxism, and specific, specifically uh, sexual identity Marxism among kids at every level, K through 12, okay? So what I wanna do this morning and um, it, again, we were supposed to do this on yesterday, 
and I apologize for us not being able to do this on yesterday in multiple sessions, but I was in the COVID penalty box and wasn't allowed to fly. Um, yeah, we were, we were supposed to leave on Monday and now they make you do your test within, you know, 24 hours and we had all had COVID a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, we go on Sunday and take our test and then they call me later Sunday evening, you know, and oh, I'm sorry, you're in the COVID penalty box. And uh, I was supposed to start lecturing at uh, the Institute of Public Theology in Fort Myers and was supposed to start class there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, come down here do the, the conference and then Sunday service and then go back up and finish lecturing there. And so I wasn't able to start my class. I had to start it virtually, uh, which was interesting because, you know, we had a, you know, like 35 students show up to take this course in cultural apologetics and their professor couldn't be there because he flunked a test. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we, we our test again and we're able to get here on yesterday so glad to be able to uh, to do this but we've got a lot that we're going to try to do um, I'm going to share a lot of uh, citations with you a lot of quotations with you but I, it's very important that we do this it's, it's not always the most exciting way um, to cover material but it's very important that we do this it's very important that you see this some of this stuff I've been sharing for a decade or more now. Um, as you know, I've been talking about this and teaching about this, but now that all of this is sort of coming together and now that it's being exposed and expanding, it seems that things are ramping up and moving even more rapidly than they have been in the past. So a couple of passages of scripture I wanna share with you first. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. This is our mandate. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. That, that's what this is. This is not just cultural warfare. This is spiritual warfare. These are individuals who are at war with our God and consequently they are at war with us. In, in this particular area, they're at war with the word of God. Romans chapter one, verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. One last passage of scripture is very important as we talk about this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light hmm. and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what we're seeing today. We're seeing those who call good evil and who call evil good, who exchange light for darkness and bitter for sweet but they even go beyond that in that they are at war with those who call dark, dark and light, light. Amen? Amen. They, they, they find it hugely problematic and attempt to shame and silence those who say what God says about sin. And so part of that changing light for darkness and darkness for light is a changing of definitions. Listen to this from Mark Stein. I think it's poignant. In the old days, there was sodomy, an act. In the late 19th century, the word homosexuality was coined, a condition. A generation ago, the accepted term became gay, an identity. Each formulation raises the stakes. One can object to and even criminalize an act. 
One is obligated to be sympathetic toward a condition, but once it's a fully fledged 24 seven identity, anything less than wholehearted acceptance gets you marked as a bigot. The transformation of a crime against nature, sodomy, into co-equal civic identity with little more, within little more than the span of one human lifetime is one of the most remarkable victories ever achieved by any minority group in the Western world. A minority that didn't even exist in a formal sense a century ago has managed to overwhelm and overhaul a universal societal institution thousands of years old. Again, and, and nowadays, if, if you think wrongly about this or speak wrongly about this, you are treated today in a way that sodomy would have been treated a century ago. Because today, sodomy is not a sin, but the biblical view of sodomy is a sin. Woe to those Amen. who call evil good and good evil. But that's where we are. And that's where this current generation especially is being educated and discipled. This is what they're being taught. There's a chart here that I wanted to show you. It's um, often used in educational circles. And the idea here, you see privilege in the center. The idea is the closer that you move to the center, the more privileged you are. Now you have to understand that this connection between critical theory and postmodernism. Um, critical theory divides the world up into oppressors and the oppressed. We talked about how critical race theory does this with whiteness and with non-whiteness. And then this postmodern idea that everything is a construct, right? And that even language, language is used within the context of power dynamics to create these constructs that are all about power. Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, gives us this idea of, of cultural hegemony and how those in authority, the oppressors, actually use this cultural hegemony, this ideology, in order to enforce their oppression. And for Gramsci, he saw um, the law and, you know, education and uh, the family and religion and politics really as the main ways that these things took place. But in this chart, if you'll take a look at it, Look, for example, in terms of gender. And toward the center, privileged, cisgender men. And then out from that, less powerful, less privileged, cisgender women. And then outside of that is trans, intersex, non-binary people. When it comes to sexuality, which is different than your gender, according to these folks, heterosexuals are in the center there. And outside of that, lesbian, gay, queer, pan, bi, asexual are outside of that. Then you see skin color, you see citizenship. It's interesting, you know, on the inside of that, the privileged people are the people who are citizens. And then there's permanent residence, right? And then there's precarious status. And then there's no status. What's interesting is, they go to no status, they don't go to illegal aliens. You, you notice that's not on the chart? Because that's just, a, that's just a construct, right? By the way, this is another one of the boxcars. Um, so uh, again, everything is about the oppressor and the oppressed, and all of our interactions are about power imbalances and people who have privilege and people who don't have privilege. This is where the connection comes from. And you remember when I said that the, the whole idea of 
critical theory, critical race theory, you know, sexual identity Marxism, that they're all connected at their root. Even the whole LGBTQAI plus, two plus, whatever, right? These things are, you know, they're contradictions within the acronym, but they're all connected by this idea of privilege and power. Critical theory, critical race theory, cultural Marxism, this is where they're all connected. And at their root, they're being taught to our children. This is from two authors named Kirk and Matson. I'll say more about them. But Kirk and Matson argue that to suggest publicly that homosexuality might be chosen is a huge problem because it opens what they call that can of worms known as moral choice and sin. And it gives the religious intransigence a stick to hit us with. So th this can't be a choice. Homosexuality can't be a choice, um, which we'll see is incredibly ironic. Listen to what they state in their book, After the Ball. Straits must be taught that it is as natural for some persons to be homosexual as it is for others to be heterosexual. Wickedness and seduction have nothing to do with it. And since no choice is involved, gayness can be no more blameworthy than straightness. If there's no choice, right? If I was born this way, then how can it be blameworthy? In fact, it is a simple matter of the odds, one in 10, as to who turns out gay and who turns out straight. Each heterosexual must be led to realize that he might easily have been born homosexual himself. Now, that number one in 10, the authors in this book that was published in 1989, acknowledge the fact that they just made the number up. As late as 94, we know that 2.8% of males and 1.4% of females identified themselves as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. By the way, that number has grown exponentially in recent years, the number of people who identify themselves this way. And there's a number of reasons for that. But the point that I'm making here is that when Kirk and Madsen, by the way, they're two Harvard professors um, who, who wrote the book After the Ball, uh, when they wrote this, one in 10, they acknowledged, even in their writings, that the one in 10 wasn't factual, but it was a useful piece of propaganda. One in 10, one in 10. So there are key exponents of this idea. People who connect the idea of your race or ethnicity, and the idea of your sexual identity. People who they don't say, right, this is all critical theory, this is all cultural Marxism. They don't say that at, at its roots, this is what's connecting us, this is what's connecting our movements. But there are people who became key exponents of this whole gay is the new black idea. Um, a couple of decades ago, it was, it was, a, really, it was a really big thing, right? Um, the Advocate ran a cover story. The Advocate, for those of you who don't know, is um, a very uh, popular uh, gay magazine. They ran this cover story, Gay is the New Black, right? And the idea was clear. The idea was that, you know, in the civil rights struggle, we have now moved to another area and another level of the civil rights struggle, and that's the struggle for gay rights, which you know, it would be argued now that people have moved beyond that to now trans rights. But who are these key exponents? One, homosexual activists, obviously. Two, um, black and civil rights leaders. Three, judges for business and political leaders, and then finally, religious leaders. These, the, these are people who are putting forward this idea that gay is the new black, and that the sexual identity movement, sexual identity Marxism, is a continuation of this social justice movement and this quest for so-called racial justice 
and again, some people are thrown by this last one, and I'll say this because we probably, well, there's no probably, we won't be able to get through all of, all of this. But in this last area, they're like, people are like, wait, religious leaders? You mean like religious, religious? Yes, religious leaders. There's a couple of movements that you need to be aware of. Um, one is called Living Out. There's a ministry called Living Out. There's another one called Revoice. Um, and these people have done conferences within mainline churches. We're not talking about, you know, the, 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 the pro-homosexual denominations, you know, the usual suspects or whatever. Um, but Revoice, for example, was in a number of Presbyterian churches. Um, and the Revoice conference was very popular. And there are a number of mainstream evangelical leaders who have endorsed the Revoice conference. Um, the gay Christian movement, more broadly, um, you may have heard of the gay Christian movement. Um, there are a lot of religious leaders who are now advocating for the whole gay Christian movement. But let's see how many of these we can get to and get through. First, obviously, homosexual advocates are, or activists are, are advocating for this position. This masterful connection of gayness with blackness. But why? Now, this book, After the Ball, How America Will Overcome Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the Decade of the 90s. Again, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen, two professors at Harvard, one in psychology and one in marketing. They published this book in 1989. And I always point out that this book was published in 89 because when, when you read it and when you read from it, it sounds like something that was written more recently to explain what happened, not something that was written in 89 as a strategic manual for what was supposed to happen. But that's what it was. In 1989, it was a strategic manual for how to change the way people think, believe, and talk about homosexuality. Again, when you read it, it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like somebody got in a time machine, came to, you know, these times, saw what happened in the whole, you know, homosexual movement, and then went back to 1988 and wrote a book that was published in 1989. There's some back to the future stuff going on, right? Listen to what they say about the moment. Remember 1988, 1989, right? Um, AIDS was then what COVID is now, amen? It's all, it was on everybody's lips. Everybody was talking about AIDS back then, right? Like people are talking about COVID now. Here's what they wrote. AIDS, though a loose cannon, is a cannon indeed. As cynical as it may seem, AIDS gives us a chance, however brief, to establish ourselves as a victimized minority, legitimately deserving of America's special protection and care. This, therefore, is the question and the challenge. How can we surmount our insurmountable opportunity? How can we maximize the sympathy and minimize the fear? How, given the horrid hand that AIDS has dealt us, can we best play it? That's what they were writing about in 1989. How, how do we do this? This could be a tipping point in one direction or the other. People could turn against the homosexual movement because of AIDS, or, or if we could somehow use this to gain a minority identity and a minority status, within the context of critical theory, critical race theory, oppressor oppressed. If we can put ourselves on the oppressed list as we're already moving forward with these ideologies of critical theory, critical race theory, I noted before and I noted in fault lines that you know this book came out in 1989. 1989 was also the first year that they had an official conference of critical race theory, right? It was started by some Harvard law professors. Um, 
so Derek Bell was the, the principal leader of, of that group and that movement. They had their first uh, meeting in 1989. Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a protege of Derek Bell at Harvard Law School, wrote her seminal paper on intersectionality, which is an arm and a branch of critical race theory, also in 1989. And then Peggy McIntosh, um, who wrote uh, the, the seminal paper on the concept of white privilege, published that paper in 1989. The same year that this book comes out, talking about identifying themselves, right, as this aggrieved minority group within the same vein and the same context of the advance of cultural Marxism with racial identity. So the method, what, 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 are they, what are they going to do? What did these two Harvard professors propose? I'm glad you asked. The campaign we, out, we outline, and after the ball, though complex, depends centrally upon a program of unabashed propaganda, firmly grounded in long-established principles of psychology and advertising. Remember, I told you, one professor of psychology and one of marketing. But they said propaganda. Certainly, they're just using that loosely, right? No, they actually define propaganda in the book. They say that it relies on emotional manipulation, uses lies, and is subjective and one-sided. Just in case you were wondering what they meant when they said it was propaganda. Relies on emotional manipulation, uses lies, and is subjective and one-sided. That was the play. That was the strategy. To tell their side of the story and to frame their side of the story in such a way that they got what they were after. Three things they used. Desensitizing, jamming, and conversion. Um, they also acknowledged the fact that these are the three steps in brainwashing. Um, but these were the three steps that they used. What, what does this mean? Well, first, desensitizing. The idea of desensitizing was very simple. And what they argued was that they needed to get images of gays and gayness into the public arena. They, they needed to have, you know, TV shows and, and commercials and, you know, uh, out athletes and actors and actresses, and they needed to use this. They, they, need, they, they used an illustration, and, and they talked about turning on a shower, right? And just overwhelming the straight world with this so that after a while, they get used to being wet. That's desensitizing. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you watched a, a show? Um, and when I say a show, I don't mean like a single episode. But when was the last time you watched a series, right? Just think about your favorite series, right? Whatever series it is that you like. When was the last time you watched a series on television that did not have a gay character? or that did not introduce a gay storyline. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you just, you can't turn on the TV without seeing it. Now you, now there are commercials and the commercials come out and when the commercials are about, you see gay characters or, or, or gay couples in the commercials, they are everywhere, not everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. It's beyond everywhere, right? You can't get away from it. So much so, so that when people watch television, you know, when they watch these series, if you live in an environment where you're not surrounded by this, you almost start to think that your circles are the strange ones. That's desensitizing. The next tool they use is jamming. 
And the way they talk about jamming is that they, they, they want to eliminate and reverse what they call psychic rewards. So the way that they explain jamming is this. You equate being against homosexuality with being part of the KKK or skinheads or neo-Nazis. So that when people think about homosexuality and they think about whatever, their biblical position on homosexuality, their biblical position on gay marriage, that they automatically have a check. They're jammed, right? It's like you, you've got a machine and they throw sand in the work so that the machine gets jammed and it doesn't work. So now you have to stop because you feel bad about believing what the Bible says about homosexuality. This is why, for example, if you want to see jamming at work, what you do is watch a sermon by a pastor in the last, especially five years, maybe 10 years, on homosexuality. Most guys will spend the first quarter to a third of the sermon softening the blow. And listen, I don't hate gay people. I have family members who are gay. I have friends who are gay. I just want you to know, again, the first quarter to third of the sermon is trying to soften the blow. They do it in a way that they would never do a sermon, for example, on uh, drunkenness. You don't start that by saying, listen, I don't hate drunks. I don't hate drug addicts. I have family members, I have friends who are drug addicts. Adultery. Listen, church, I just want to say up front, as I preach this message, I don't hate adulterers. I love adulterers. God loves adulterers. I have friends who are adulterers. Family members of mine who are knee deep in adultery. So as I preach this sermon, I just want you to keep that in mind. God loves adulterers. You see, we laugh because it's, it's ridiculous. Amen. But sermons on homosexuality start like this because we've been effectively jammed. It's worked. Then there's conversion. Now, by conversion, they're not talking about, you know, making uh, straight people gay. That's not what they mean. Uh, by conversion. By conversion, what they mean is something more sinister. By conversion, they mean changing people's minds and attitudes about homosexuality, about LGBTQIA2+, so that they become allies. Um, by the way, in the acronym LGBTQIA2+, I told you what the two is for, right? That's the idea of two-spirit. And they, they, they get that from um, in, in indigenous groups and communities, right? American Indians. Um, they used to have this idea of two-spirit, a way that they would talk about people who were either, you know, homosexual or, or, or whatever, or whatever you, you have it there. So they bring that two in. We know that. We know the L is for, you can say it, lesbian, right? You know, G is for, B, bisexual, okay? T, transgender, okay? Q, queer or questioning, okay? I, intersex, do you know what the A is for? Allies. A is for allies. You see, that's the purpose of conversion, is to create A's, to create allies. So even in the acronym, They have allies. Now, I talked about this being contradictory. Um, the, the reason that it's contradictory is because 
And this, is, this point is made um, brilliantly in the book, The Madness of Crowds, um, written by a homosexual author, by the way. Um, but he points out the fact that for decades, the L's and the G's have been arguing it's a hardware issue, right? We've been trying to do, you know, studies and you know, to prove that it's in the genes, it's in the brain, it's in the pheromones, right? None of the studies did prove that, but, but for, for years, for decades, the lesbian movement and the gay movement was making the argument, we're born this way, it's biological. Now the trans movement comes along and says, hardwire mean, uh, that hardware means nothing, it's a software issue. So you got lesbian gays, we're born this way, it's our hardware. Transgender saying, you're evil if you let hardware dictate reality. I am who I am in spite of my hardware. Those two ideas are completely and diametrically opposed to one another and they can't both be true at the same time. Yet, they're part of the same acronym. I'll go you one better. The Q is for queer. Now, queer theory is a whole branch of critical theory. And queer theory, contrary to what many people think, it's not about, you know, a lot of people use the word queer and what they mean is gay, right? Person queer, no, 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 no. Queer theory is about non-normative sexuality. It's an identity without an essence. It's non-normative. Queer theory is about being against that which has been normalized. Well, guess what? Now that gay marriage is legal, queer theory has to be against the normalized L and G. And now that the T is being normalized, queer theory has got to be against that too, but they all still occupy the same acronym. Why? Because they're rooted and grounded in critical theory. They're rooted and grounded in cultural Marxism. They're rooted and grounded in identity Marxism. And they hope that you don't pay attention to the fact that these things are contradictory. Because the problem is power and privilege. That's what's evil, power and privilege. And all these people can be in the same acronym because compared to cisgendered, heterosexual, by the way, cisgendered means nothing. I get people who ask me that all the time. What is cis? It's a made up word. <laughs> the whole point is you have cisgendered heterosexuals in the position of power. All of it is socially constructed, right? That, that, that's what postmodernism is arguing. It's all socially constructed. None of it exists as objective reality. It's just socially constructed to keep people in power. And so all of these things may contradict one another ideologically, but when you put them on the spectrum of oppressor, oppressed, they all occupy the oppressed category. Therefore, they all belong together. Because there's one ultimate reality, and it's the ultimate reality of critical theory. Now, this may sound crazy to you. I mean, I hope it does. But the closer you are to K-12 education, the less crazy this sounds. If you're a teacher who's graduated with a degree in education in recent years, this doesn't sound crazy to you at all. 
This is what you've been inundated with for the last several years of your life. If you're an administrator in a school, this doesn't sound crazy to you at all because you're scheduling in-service training for your teachers so that they get this. If you're a student in a K through 12 school, this doesn't sound crazy to you at all because all of your curriculum is now pointed in this direction and geared toward getting you to this conclusion. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Amen. This, is, this is the next boxcar in the critical social justice train. A couple of things that I wanted to get to here before we stop this. We're supposed to, we're supposed to end this here soon. Um, First on this, before I close it, um, pedoph pedophilia is what's next. Okay? Pedophilia is what's next. Uh, pedophilia uh, rebranded in a new push to be included in the LGBTQ community. Um, they got their own flag. Um, they rebranded themselves as MAPs, minor attracted persons, right? Not pedophiles minor attracted persons. They're making the same arguments that the gay Christian movement is making. So the gay Christian movement is making this argument. It's not wrong to have a homosexual orientation and to be attracted to people of the same sex. It's only wrong when you act on it. That's the gay Christian movement's argument. And that's also the pedophile's argument. Being attracted to minors, that, that's, that's not a problem. I mean, as long as you're not abusing minors, right? It's the exact same argument that groups like Living Out and Revoice are making about homosexuality. Um, there's a, a tweet here about a, a, a professor, a university professor who wrote a book normalizing uh, this idea of minor attracted persons. Okay, all right, quickly for the sake of time. I, I want to look at this next group because it's where the connection becomes more clear. Well, because you may think, and, and I thought at one time that what was happening was that Kirk and Madsen and people like them were co-opting the civil rights movement, right? that they're jumping on the bandwagon. They looked at the civil rights movement and they said, wow, look at how successful that has been if we could just get in on some of that. Um, but that's not the way that it happened. Um, Julian Bond who was the head of the NAACP. African-Americans were the only Americans who were enslaved for two centuries, but we were far from the only Americans suffering discrimination then and now. Sexual disposition parallels race. In other words, gay is the new black. Coretta Scott King, banning same-sex marriage is a form of gay bashing because gay is the new black. Michael Steele, former chair of the Republican National uh, Committee. Oh no, I don't think I've ever really subscribed to that view that you can turn it on or off like water or like a water tap. I think there's a whole lot that goes into the makeup of an individual that you just can't simply say, oh, like tomorrow morning, I'm gonna stop being gay. It's like saying tomorrow morning, I'm gonna stop being black because gay is the new black. But even back in the civil rights movement, listen to this from Baird Rustin, and you may not know this name, but I'll explain to you who this individual was after this quote. Today, blacks are no longer the litmus paper or the barometer of social change. Blacks are in every segment of society. By the way, this is back in the 60s and 70s, he's saying this. 
Blacks are in every level uh, segment of society, and there are laws that help to protect them from racial discrimination. The new niggers are gays. It is in this sense that gay people are the new barometer for social change. The question of social change should be framed with the most vulnerable group in mind, gay people. Now, who's Rustin? Uh, Rustin was a homosexual. He was a cultural Marxist. He was arrested in 1956 for public sodomy. He was a member of the Communist Party USA. He was a member of the American Socialist Party. Went to India in the 1940s to study Gandhi's nonviolent tactics and then came back to the United States and was Martin Luther King Jr.'s mentor for the nonviolent tactics of the civil rights movement. He was also one of King's ghostwriters and Rustin spoke at the March on Washington. Nor was he the only one in the movement. King was well aware of Rustin's and James Baldwin's homosexuality. You know, James Baldwin, the black poet. He knew that their tendency was to mingle black social justice with gay social justice. King agreed with another close advisor and ghostwriter, ghostwriter Stanley Levinson, Levinson was a white guy, that the race issue should be priority. Homosexuality was not to be conflated during the climactic point of the 1960s. But King and Levinson agreed that Rustin and Baldwin were more qualified to lead the homosexual movement after the climax of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Nobody co-opted the civil rights movement. This was linked long before Kirk and Matson wrote After the Ball. And it was well known at the time. Well, I hate to do it, but we have to stop. But before we stop, let me say this. Um, that wasn't the only civil rights movement that attached these two things. Um, in the 90s, when Nelson Mandela was re released from prison and became president in South Africa, um, a number of his advisors had left South Africa and been educated in the West. They were sort of exiles right, during the apartheid period. And these individuals had great influence on Mandela and the rest of the leaders of that movement. Uh, so that uh, under Mandela, South Africa became the fifth nation in the world and the first nation and so far still the only nation in Africa to legalize same-sex marriage. Because under Mandela, they also linked black civil rights and gay civil rights. So again, this is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. All right, I know it's a lot. It's only a fraction of what we're supposed to be dealing with this weekend. So I guess I'm gonna have to write another book.